Yeah, th thank you very much, and uh, good uh, morning, and thank you, uh, Nick, because I now I, I now know what my my role is in life. You know, uh, sometimes you get in uh, this uh, this inspiration or this information in strange ways, but uh, I think that uh, there it looks to me like you're describing that there's a great need for harm reduction in in mining this gap and reducing this 17 year. Span. By the way, 17 is an unlucky number in Italy. Uh, when I first met Sabrina, I arrived on uh, uh, platform 17 at 1717 in Venice, right? And uh, I thought that was fine, but she said, oh my God, that's unlucky. So, but <laughs> turned out to be all right. Uh, in any case, uh, so I think that there's a, there's a role for some, uh, what I would call research me intermediaries. And I think that a lot of uh, what we've been doing in our, our work is in some ways in the last years been uh, positioning ourselves as research intermediaries. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more as we uh, get into this talk here. So uh, I'm gonna talk to you uh, today about social marketing and insight-driven approaches to vaccine confidence uh, building. Now, this, let me just click here. Is this, okay. Uh, this, uh, I'm gonna draw on a variety of guides and guidances and pamphlets that we have produced for a variety of intergovernmental uh, uh, agencies, uh, mainly uh, the World Health Organization European region and the European CDC, ECDC. Um, let me just say to start out that uh, the views I'm expressing are my own views and the views of our uh, our our own group and don't necessarily represent ECDC's views or WHO's views. Uh, having said that, uh, our relationship with ECDC is a very interesting one, and I think it bears on what I want to communicate here. That is that we have this framework contract with ECDC, which means that uh, we provide them with communication uh, assistance of, for uh, we agree for certain terms, and we uh, to uh, identify experts to help them uh, with specific uh, tasks. All right, and most of the tasks turn up to be trying to turn research into some kind of guidance to help uh, frontline practitioners and frontline public health managers do their work better. Okay. Uh, and in most of these contracts that we have, we end up trying to work with different uh, university groups, consulting groups, um, and to create, uh, to, to do systematic reviews, to do rapid literature reviews, to do original qualitative uh, research, to do some quantitative research, to package that in the first instance as a guidance for frontline practitioners, right? We're always, first instance is a practical guide. Secondarily, and in all the countries, we say we want to produce a peer-reviewed research paper that describes that, what the content that we included in the guide. So we're reversing that process a little bit about not going to research first and then waiting 17 years to get the practical work. We're focusing on the practical. And that's why we signed this contract with them because that's really what we like uh, to do. So, uh, oh, we're going the wrong way here, okay. So what are my aims uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this session today? I want to talk to you, uh, re-emphasizing, because I've been hearing it in lots of the, the talks given already, the importance of listening, matching, and sustaining. Listening to gain insights on uh, target-specific determinants of hesitancy, matching those interventions to specific determinants, and finally, sustaining those interventions through adaptive framing and engagement strategies. I'll get this down. Social marketing, definition, uh, we work with this definition. Social marketing is an active interventional approach that seeks to integrate marketing concepts with other approaches, and there's uh, many uh, health promotion approaches, health literacy approaches, uh, behavioral, uh, uh, other behavioral approaches um, to influence behaviors 
that benefit individuals and communities for social uh, good. When we're talking about behavior in, 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 in social marketing, we, we know behavior is, is influenced by information, attitudes, and values. We've been hearing about this in different actions. And here we're looking at some of those other influencing factors uh, that affect uh, the uh, behaviors. Uh, in terms of uh, time and cost, in terms of effort and convenience, in terms of social consequences and competing uh, be behaviors. So what are some of the social marketing characteristics that we should be aware of in, in some of our work? And uh, many of you have already described uh, that you're very engaged in, in some of these uh, approaches. Uh, first of all, that social marketing uh, can provide sort of a rational, logical, systematic approach to this, uh, to gathering the kinds of insights uh, in relationship to behavior that we need to uh, identify in order to take some action in terms of trying to uh, make some, uh, some change in behaviors. It's as we say, it draws on many theories and approaches. Uh, we hope that uh, any of these systematic approaches will be flexible and that it is informed by a lot of uh, commercial marketing uh, techniques, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So in this guide that we produced uh, with uh, Jeff French and, and uh, some of his uh, uh, colleagues uh, around uh, a social marketing guide, which is uh, available and we put it on the uh, pad and you can uh, download this, uh, we, we introduced this systematic uh, 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 approach, uh, which, uh, for lack of a better term, is called STELA, which is sort of scope, test, and act, learn, and act. And uh, this approach has a, a, you know, a wide variety of uh, tasks that we can identify to do, and we talk about some activities. And also in the guide, there's a variety of tools, little uh, 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 graphs and uh, checklists and uh, different kinds of uh, schematics that can help in terms of uh, a, a addressing some, some of these issues. I'm not going to get into a lot of the, the details of that, but I, I want to uh, just uh, make you aware that that's what's uh, available there. So certainly social marketing, we've already heard about some of the behavioral theories that inform and inspired some of the people that have talked earlier, but certainly uh, diff the diffusion theory, issues related to persuasion, uh, some of the Prokaska uh, the trans theoretical uh, model, stages of change, ecological model, all those uh, can, are brought into some of the activities in relationship uh, to uh, social marketing. So we also say it draws on other identities. And it, we, we, can, uh, we can embrace the concept of being a social marketer, fine, if that works for you. you know, If that kind of uh, framing of, uh, of a set of skills works for you, that's great. But it also, for a time, we identified ourselves as health literacy advocates. Uh, but it, it, a lot of the same kind of considerations uh, that, uh, that, that social marketing help us with are also uh, quite key to issues like self, health literacy here, which is people's ability to access, understand, or use information for health. They, there's the individual skills and ability, but all those individual skills and ability are shaped by the kinds of demands or complexity of the systems in which pe people are operating with, and it influences their behaviors, and uh, so that we pay attention to, to all that. Uh, and health promotion, going back to 1986, uh, some of our Canadian friends here will recognize the Ottawa Charter, also talking about the basic principles of health promotion, again, looking at individual skills, looking at supportive environments, looking at uh, uh, environmental influences, so we're, all of these uh, approaches kind of can, can, are integrated and can, uh, some of the uh, activities can be brought to bear when we uh, talk about uh, social marketing approaches. And if we compare social marketing with commercial marketing approaches, we see that the differences come out where we're talking about more about changing behavior, you know, as opposed to uh, an objective of, of earning uh, money. Uh, social marketing uh, intangible products versus tangible products, mostly funded by third parties as opposed to funded by the companies themselves, long-term goals versus short-term goals, influenced by social and political imperatives versus profit uh, incentives, 
and primarily non-financial measures in terms of uh, whether it's success or not around behavioral change versus uh, bottom line kind of measures in commercial marketing. Although we should be aware that a lot of those differences have changed over time as in some ways uh, the commercial world is much more conscious about their uh, social image uh, and their, their social uh, perception. And so they saw there, there's some more activity about trying to uh, uh, paint themselves uh, more in a, uh, with a sort of social marketing uh, in addition to commercial marketing. So uh, our first uh, issue that we wanted to focus on is listening first, you know, and this really does relate to uh, changing some of our long-term mindsets. And I would say that I would sort of said years ago, this was a done deal, you know, uh, we, we've already moved away from the notion of directive uh, command and control messaging that we, we long ago, we understood the importance of talking to people and, under, and get a sense uh, of, uh, about what people understand so that we can tune our messages. I mean, way back when, when I was uh, working as a, a GP in a hospital in California, we had a routine that the, the nurse would always come into the office after the doctor was there and ask the patient, what did, the, what, what did the doctor say? And then we gave feedback to people trying to get a sense that the people didn't really understand what you were saying very much, so that uh, we try to reshape our communication skills that. But if we just realize, if we look at what happened with the recent Ebola uh, crisis and stuff, we realize that we haven't learned a lot in terms of this kind of external directive kind of communication. and. Uh, you know, the kinds of messaging that was going forth during the uh, EPLA epidemic from a lot of the international agencies was, let's get people to isolation centers. Well, who wants to go to an isolation center? How about maybe going to a treatment center? You know, I mean, the isolation center says, you know. And it, so it was, really, it was really difficult. And it was part of the problem in terms of why it was so slow to engage the population, because there wasn't that sensitivity. And now, uh, now uh, within WHO uh, 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 circles, where they've integrated uh, anthropologists into teams and are looking at cultural issues and uh, high time is what I say. So what we're saying here is that we have an understanding here, and we've heard it now, that we have a customer orientation so that we talk with our customers, our patients, our clients before we uh, start developing our, our, our strategy. We want to get in insights in, into uh, their realities. Um, Eduardo, a little uh, a baby here, is, is pictured with his mom, his father, his grandma, and his grandpa. And uh, we were talking with them about some of the issues uh, they uh, had in relationship to vaccination, all right? Now, if we were just doing this uh, uh, over, uh, you know, uh, uh, at, at a great distance, we wouldn't have uh, understood that while we here sitting in, uh, in Eduardo's uh, living room, that this was actually the outside of Eduardo's house. And this is the community in which Eduardo's house exists in, all right? So Eduardo is, is, a, is, a, is a Roma child in a, in a Roma settlement in uh, central Slovakia. Uh, and when we talk with uh, Roma uh, mothers and grandmothers in uh, focus groups, both in Spain and in Slovakia and in Romania, we ask them about what advice you might give to healthcare providers to make them more sensitive to your reality, to make you trust them more, to make you relate to them better, all right? And, uh, and we, we developed, and this was, is reported in our Let's Talk About Protection uh, pamphlet that we showed earlier, but that was produced by ECDC. And some of the kinds of messages that the Roma uh, moms and grand uh, moms mainly uh, provide us with was they would say things like, know more about us. Know something about our culture. Most of the people talking about it don't know anything about us. And we, there's a lot of specific realities around our understanding of what health is and stuff, if you're going to talk about vaccination. And for you, they said, please stop framing us as hard to reach populations. You know, our sense is that we're poorly reached. It's your problem. You're not, it's not our problem. We're not hard to reach. You're 
having a problem reaching us. View immunization as one part of a larger health challenge. It says, hey, look, we live in this community. Is that our biggest problem, vaccination? We've got a lot of other problems deal with, to deal with here. Integrate us into mainstream programs. Don't segregate us in this. We want to be part and we want to integrate it. This is a, a, an example of the kinds of insights that you can get through this uh, kind of listening uh, exercise. And uh, it, it basic to uh, social marketing, that we want a desired behavior, in this case, vaccination uptake, acceptance. We need to look at some of the f factors, the incentives, the rewards, the barriers, the, uh, the obstacles, uh, you know, and we need to work on, uh, on, on trying to uh, remove or reduce those and uh, build up on the desired ones and reduce the, uh, the problematic ones. So message two, matching interventions to determine. So we were going listening and we're getting insights. Now we know something about some of the factors and stuff like that. So uh, we, uh, we did a, a study uh, with the uh, London School of Hygiene uh, on uh, a, a rapid review on what were some of the uh, uh, determinants of uh, vaccine hesitancy. And we followed sort of the SAGE model and uh, we came up with this list of uh, determinants based on this literature review and all these references are in the, uh, uh, the publication. Uh, but you can, and we sort of geared the kinds of determinants uh, based on the number of times they were mentioned. It's uh, one uh, a method, methodology. But you sort of get a sense of the, uh, of the, these, uh, the, these uh, categories of determinants. So uh, just as a sort of a, a, a summary or to give a little extract of it, we talked about contextual issues. Uh, and the major one that was in the literature was about conspiracy theories, uh, but a lot about distrust in institutions. Uh, individual and group factors, there's stuff about vaccine safety uh, and around vaccine and vaccine-specific issues around things like access. So some of our uh, uh, hesitancy determinants. So we start looking at what are some of these determinants uh, that we need to uh, have our... Uh, uh, specific interventions around. And then we're, so we start looking at the literature of what kind of interventions uh, are people utilizing. And this is the kind of uh, list of, of, of interventions regarding some of the content of communication strategies and interventions around design, format, and uh, content. Uh, and then what we want to do, looking at the the, this re, re, reflects different kinds of interventions, many of which we've talked about over these, uh, this day and a half, where there's some about control, and we uh, started some discussion, and we'll have some more discussion later uh, this morning about some regulatory uh, interventions informing. I think that we've heard, uh, in fact, I think we were greatly encouraged uh, by uh, some of the... Um, uh, some so, some of the uh, so, some of the re reports that maybe uh, giving more information in better ways actually uh, is 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 effective in changing behavior. It's sort of this motivational interviewing. Quite love that uh, that concept and that issue, and I want to come back to that a little bit. The design of systems, for sure, about how uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the the just the the. Uh, the vaccine journey, the, the, the travel of the uh, mom uh, to the clinic and, and back and all the factors that can, uh, to, the, to the needle as it were, and all the factors that could help or, or, or interfere with that. Education, uh, support, different uh, interventions. Applying it to the hesitancy and bringing in from some of the literature review, uh, uh, something about individual, uh, individual this is telling me that I got to move. Uh, individual beliefs uh, that uh, discussion and information and education, something about uh, contextual, about mistrust in institutions, development of regulatory initiatives, uh, something about uh, uh, adverse reporting systems being quite uh, open about that, vaccination, vaccination related, reducing uh, costs and better uh, access. Uh, 
here we talk about some of the uh, behavioral economic stuff with the hugs, smacks, shoves, and nudges uh, applied to apply to uh, vaccination around hugs, where, which are more in the sort of conscious, uh, cognitive intervention kind of stuff, offering rewards for being vaccinated. Uh, smacks would be penalties for not being vaccinated. Uh, nudges would be more about the, the unconscious uh, but systematic uh, uh, communications, vaccination uh, given unless a parent opts out. Uh, shoves would be requirement for vaccination before school entry, things of that sort. Uh, so we should just say quickly that we also looked at healthcare providers in a qualitative study. And to say that while this was, uh, we were actually trying to select healthcare providers that were in poorly, uh, in low uh, vaccination areas, we, we, and we did this in, in four countries, we found that healthcare providers had a lot of concerns and there was some hesitancy among healthcare providers and we have published that in, uh, in vaccine. So all of say, so we have listening, we have matching uh, interventions uh, to the, and then we talk about sustaining and this is where it comes back to uh, some of the uh, uh, issues that, uh, that Nick uh, just, uh, just raised with us. We think about contextualization is key to sustaining uh, these uh, social, uh, social marketing interventions uh, to change behavior. Uh, and uh, contextualization in this case are insights, intelligent evidence, putting it into meaningful and real context. And so what do we do that? We talk about packaging uh, uh, our materials and guides, toolkits, checklists, prototyping and piloting that and positioning them in, in ways that are trustworthy. So working with an intergovernmental agency like uh, ECDC puts us into a, a with, with an evidence-based uh, platform, uh, puts us into a more trustworthy position to offer uh, guidance uh, to uh, member states. We talked uh, yesterday, Sabrina introduced the stakeholder engagement model, a five-step approach to translation and adaptation. Very important. What we have found is that we take these guys that we've developed, but one of the things that ECDC has no mandate to go uh, into countries and take action in terms of implementing any of the programs. So what they've asked us to do and what, what this program came from was to take these guides and to work with national teams to adapt them uh, so that they become uh, uh, you know, understandable and usable and have a high utility with, uh, with, the, with the population. And in that process, what we found is that we've been able uh, to uh, stimulate a process uh, within the country that uh, it can maintain uh, the adaptation of other public health uh, materials as well and develops the kind of network uh, to su support uh, ongoing interventions. Uh, public engagement, public uh, policy advocacy around framing uh, the issues properly. Uh, and uh, also, I'd like to close by, by saying that I think that uh, this, there's a couple of issues that have been raised. One, I think that uh, there's a, a real uh, need and uh, I think a opportunity for intermediaries uh, in this process. Uh, and I think that, uh, that we've seen around the motivational interviewing, we, we see, I think, some vaccination intermediaries. My daughter is a doula. She's an intermediary for, in childbirth. And it relates to uh, system failures where there are system uh, challenges where there's difficulty because of the increasing technology, lack of time, lack of funds, to spend time with people and talk to people about these issues. Uh, I'd like to uh, say that I think that some of the other issues we may want to look at are things about uh, unbundling our research, looking at individual vaccines. I think we also need to start looking at un un unbundling uh, uh, the, what are the, what are the qualifications of the people that are what, what, are, what are the characteristics and qualifications of people that are doing the research? Because is, is, 
we seem to uh, feel that any any of them are doing that we we're not we're not looking at quality standards within uh, in, in in the individual re research and we need to look at that a little bit more and we need to move from more of this uh uh uh, to be to look at this uh, at this whole issue of gray literature uh, and reframe that that what we're looking for with our work is to produce something that's more usable and has a higher utility uh, for uh, frontline users and then integrate that with our research work. That's uh, all I want to say for now. Thank you very much.